Um, going to speak about wound care like Dr. Masimila has already said. Uh, just a few basic principles to help healing and um, recent updates. It's a very broad topic, but I'll try and cover basic principles. Um, so just an introduction, a wound is a disruption of normal structure and function of the skin and skin architecture. An acute wound has a normal wound physiology and healing is anticipated to progress through the normal stages of wound healing. A chronic wound is defined as one that is physiologically impaired. So to ensure proper healing, the wound bed needs to be well vascularized, free of devitalized tissue, clear of infection and moist. Wound dressings need to eliminate dead space, control exudate, prevent bacterial overgrowth, ensure proper fluid balance, be cost efficient, manageable for patient and nursing staff. There's many topical and alternative um, therapies available that are meant to improve the wound healing environment, but there's um, lacking data to support any definitive recommendations. So like I said, basic principles and then the actual um, dressings that we will use, I'll explain some of what is available, but there's no um, data to support any particular one. Um, this is just a little cartoon to show that wound care has changed quite a bit over the years, so it's quite important to keep up to date with what's available to us. So there's many of advanced wound care options available, most of which are very expensive and unavailable in our setting. So the focus of this talk is just to provide information on wound care in our setting, focusing on the wounds that we deal with on a daily basis, which is um, our surgical wounds, perennial tears and pressure sores, um, and prevention of uh, wound sepsis. Surgical site infection is one of the most common complications following cesarean sections and has an incidence of 3 to 15 percent internationally and importantly it's associated with a maternal mortality of up to 3 percent. Um, a study that uh, Dr. Marcel Kutsia did uh, last year, um, pub uh, well finished last year, showed that our incidence at Tigerberg was 3.82 percent which is actually quite good comparable to the international rates. Um, there's lots of factors besides the actual wound care that affect the wound healing that we need to take note of. Um, local factors, oxygen, foreign bodies, uh, infections, systemic factors, age, sex, stress, ischemia, and importantly comorbidities, especially diabetes and HIV, which um, play a factor in the wound healing process. So before we even look at the wound, you need to treat the cause of why the wound is not healing appropriately and address those factors before you can start um, getting anywhere with your wound. So uh, just some pathophysiology of how wounds heal. Um, the two main ways that the wounds heal are pri by first intention and second intention. Um, first intention is when you usually have your clean surgical wound, um, the edges are easily opposed and um, they can be sutured. Second intention is when you've got large gaping wounds and you can't oppose the edges, so there's considerable tissue loss. The wound heals by granulation instead of um, apposition of the edges. Then you've got primary and secondary healing, uh, which is definitely the intention. Primary healing is when you've got healing of your clean, uninfected wound, like the surgical wound. There's very scanty granulation tissue and your healing time is usually very short and you'll get a neat linear scar. Secondary healing, refers to the healing of an infected wound, which will be irregular, mostly by granulation tissue, long healing times, and um, contracted irregular wounds. So just another flow diagram to explain. You need to treat your underlying conditions. You need to pick up a wound that is not healing appropriately early. You need patient compliance because 90% of wound care is patient dependent. When to initiate appropriate antibiotics, I'll explain when and who get antibiotics um, later on. Uh, at lifestyle factors and then when to debride the wound. So starting off with primary wound care, this, this is with your post-op clean wound. Like I said, optimize your risk factors. With regards to antibiotics, all wounds are colonized with microbes. However, not all wounds are infected. So antibiotic therapy is not indicated for all wounds and should be reserved for wounds that appear clinically infective, infected. There are no published evidence to support prophylactic prolonged antibiotic therapy for non-infected chronic wounds. It doesn't improve the healing potential of the wounds um, if there is no clinical evidence of infection. RCOG does recommend a STAT uh, uh, third generation cephalosporin for 
pre um, op, well, seizures, but uh, not for uh, a course of antibiotics post op unless there is signs of infection. So, basic principles assess the wound, control the bleeding, clean the wound, approximate the edges if you can, treat the cause, um, avoid trauma, manage the exudate, uh, avoid infection, and pain control. These are two that we normally tend to forget. They also play very important fact, um, parts in the healing of the wound, uh, nutrition and psychological stress. So if we do note that there is any evidence of malnutrition or psychological issues in the patient, they, we should refer to the dietitian. We should refer to our social workers and psychologists to address these issues. Um, wound debridement is the most important part of a, a non-healing uh, non wound. A chronic wound has an inadequate cellular response to the wound healing stimuli, which includes accumulation of devitalized tissue, decreased angiogenesis, hyperkeratotic tissue, exudate, and biofilm formation. Biofilm is a bacterial overgrowth on the surface of the wound. They cause a reduced response to the host's natural immune system. They um, induce chronic inflammation, and this leads to the damage of the proteins that are essential for wound closure. Um, biofilms also impede keratinocyte migration and proliferation that causes delayed wound closure. Um, they also increase the level of exudate, which then perpetuates the biofilm and um, impedes penetration of antibiotics and antiseptic agents to the wound. So this layer needs to be removed for any of the, the um, topical therapy, for any of the antibiotics to be able to work for your wound. 60% of chronic wounds and 6% of acute wounds have got biofilms present, and these wounds need a planned serial debridement to restore wound uh, healing environment. <clears throat> There's four mechanisms of um, debridement that are available. So I'll go through them one at a time. The first one is irrigation. Irrigation is just flushing the wound with a warm isotonic, um, no, usually normal saline, um, to decrease the bacterial load. It's part of your routine wound management. But, and there's no good evidence to support any additive to the um, saline. So they advise that you use saline for the first 48 hours, but um, there's been a couple of studies, systematic reviews, that have found no significant differences in the rates of infection with tap water compared to saline. So you can actually irrigate a wound with tap water after 48 hours. Um, they're safe for wound cleansing. Um, additions such as chloexidine, hydrogen peroxide, to the saline is generally unnecessary. Um, they have minimal action against bacteria, and some of them actually impede wound healing. Surgical debridement. You need a sharp excisional um, debridement using a scalpel or any other sharp uh, surgical instrument. This is to decrease the bacterial load and also stimulates contraction of the wound and wound epithelialization. Surgical debridement is the most appropriate choice when you have a large areas of necrotic tissue and is indicated whenever there's uh, evidence of infection. So if there is a wound that is, there's infection in the wound, then ideally it needs to be debrided. If it's um, superficial infection and just cellulitis but no past drainage, uh, it can be treated with antibiotics alone. I'll, I'll explain that a bit later as well. Enzymatic debridement involves the application of applying um, sorry, exogenous enzymatic agents to the wound. Uh, these are not readily available in our setting, but basically the one that is used commonly um, abroad is the collagenases. This is a strain of Clostridium, and what they do is promote endothelial cell and keratinocyte migration and stimulate angiogenesis and epithelialization. These are used for patients that require surgical debridement but may not be surgical candidates. Um, the other uh, form of debridement that you can use for while waiting for surgery if you uh, have a long surgical list or patients that are also not surgical debridements is the biologic um, wound debridement. So this is the larva of uh, the green bottle fly. Um, like I said, it can be used between a bridge between debridement procedures or for debridement of um, chronic wounds when you have got no surgery available. Megatherapy also can, has been shown to reduce the duration of antibiotic therapy in some patients. The larva secretes a proteolytic enzyme that liquefies the necrotic tissue 
um, and then is ingested, but they leave behind the healthy tissue. They also have an antimicrobial effect that stimulates wound healing. Randomized control trials have not found consistent reductions in the time to wound healing, and the cost is at least equivalent to hydrogels. Um, patient, the, the main disadvantage with this therapy is patients are not um, amenable to it, but patients that have undergone um, this therapy say that they would do it again. Um, also, they've shown that there was less pain associated with mega therapy. Other topical therapy so growth factors. Platelet-derived growth factor uh, promotes cellular proliferation and angiogenesis. Unfortunately, also something that we don't have available for our wounds. Epidermal growth factor uh, showed a reduction in ulcer size, but they were not statistically significant. And granulocyte um, macrophage colony simulating factor also showed significantly higher rates in um, healing. The ones that we do have readily available are the antiseptic and antimicrobial um, topical therapies. Iodine-based uh, reduces bacterial load within the wound and stimulates healing by providing a moist wound environment. It's also bactericidal to all gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Silver-based, which is what we use actually on um, the wound care clinic and the surgical department, uses silver-based topical therapy m most commonly. And um, silver is toxic to bacteria. However, there was no studies that showed that it would statistically uh, significantly improve healing at four weeks compared to non-silver containing dressings. Although they are beneficial when you have a heavy bacterial load um, to use silver-based um, therapy. When the, 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 in, the wound was not heavily infected and silver-based therapy was used, it actually caused more harm to the wounds. Honey, also something that we have got available here, has been used since ancient times for the management of wounds. They have broad-spectrum antimicrobial activity because of their high osmolality and high concentration of hydrogen peroxide. Um, there's insufficient evidence to provide any recommendations for routine use, although for specific wound types, such as burns, they, they have been shown to be quite beneficial. Uh, keratinocytes have beta adrenergic receptors, so beta blockers can influence activity in increasing the rate of maturation and migration. <clears throat> so with regards to our dressings, the basic principles are you use hydrogels for your debridement stage, a low adherent and moisture retentive dressing for the granulation stage, and a low adherent dressing for the epithelialization stage. Um, these are the common dressings that you have available. These are the open, your semi-open, and your semi-occlusive. Open would be gauze and saline. Uh, Semi-open, your paraffin, gelonate, and petroleum. And your semi-occlusive, uh, I'll go through them one at a time. Um, the main, before I go through those, the main thing, most important factor with keeping a wound, getting a wound to heal is keeping the wound moist. An important study in a pig model showed that moist wounds heal more rapidly compared with wounds that are dried out. Occluded wounds, in the acute setting, occluded wounds heal up to 40% more rapidly than non-occluded wounds because there's easier migration of the epidermal cells in a moist environment created by the dressing. Another mechanism for improved wound healing may, may be the exposure of the wound to its own fluid. Acute wound fluid is rich in platelet-derived growth factor, and this helps, like I said before, with the um, angiogenesis. Chronic wounds, however, moisture is not a good idea because chronic wound fluid is very different from acute wound fluid, and they have very high levels of inflammatory cytokines, which inhibit proliferation of fibroblasts. Um, so looking at our semi-occlusive dressings, um, films are synthetic self-adhesive dressing that are permeable to gases such as water vapor and oxygen, but they are impermeable to larger molecules such as proteins and bacteria. The advantage to them is they maintain moisture, but a disadvantage is they limit, have limited um, absorptive capacity. 
Then you've got your foams, which is, have the same advantages as the, as the films, but they have the, a high absorptive capacity, and they can also conform to the shape of the womb. Uh, the un disadvantage with a foam is they, it's not transparent, so you need to change it daily to see how your wound is healing. Your alginates are a natural complex polysaccharide uh, that comes from algae, different types of algae. Uh, they're insoluble in water, and they form an amorphous gel. These are for your moderate, moderate to heavy exudative wounds. The advantage is that they augment hemostasis, but a disadvantage is that they can be too drying if your wound is minimally exudative. So you only use these when you have a very highly exudative wound. Uh, they also tend to have an unpleasant odor. Hydrocolloids come in a gel or foam form. They are adhesive polyurethane and trap exudate and create a moist environment. They also, unfortunately, tend to trap bacteria and debris, so they need to be changed daily and irrigated so that you can get rid of the bacteria and debris that um, get trapped by the stressing. A disadvantage is then, obviously, the daily dressings, and the, they can get contact dermatitis. The hydrogels are a matrix of various types of synthetic polymers. They have a unique matrix that can absorb or donate water depending on the state of the wound. So for dry wounds, they would keep them moist, and for moist wounds, they would actually absorb the exudate. Um, however, they have shown to have increased um, wound infection because they selectively permit gram-negative um, gram bacteria to proliferate. Hydroactive um, dressings selectively absorb excess water and leave growth factors and other proteins behind. This is just it's very small, unfortunately. You can't see much. But these are two tables from up to date that just basically explain the different types of... The first table explains the different types of wound dressings, the mechanism of action, when to use them, and when they are contraindicated. And the second table it describes the type of wound, what, you want, what your goal with your wound is, how the dressing is going to help you to get to the goal, and then the different stages of the wound and how to manage the dressing at the different stages. Another diagram just to, to explain which dressings are appropriate and which wound therapies are appropriate at each stage of healing. So your ideal dressing would be one that absorbs excessive wound fluid while maintaining a moist environment one that protects the wound from further mechanical or caustic damage, prevents bacterial invasion or proliferation, conforms to the wound shape and eliminates dead space, debrides necrotic tissue, does not macerate the surrounding viable tissue, achieves hemostasis and minimizes edema through compression, does not shed fibers or compounds that could cause foreign body or hypersensitivity reactions, eliminates pain during and between the dressing changes, minimizes dressing changes, must be inexpensive, readily available, and have a long shelf life, and is transparent in order to monitor wound appearance without disrupting dressing. Obviously, such a wonderful dressing does not exist, so we would have to choose which elements we are more important in our particular wound and then choose the dressing uh, which would best suit it. Wound packing is... When you've got a very large soft tissue defect, you need to eliminate the dead space in order for the wound to heal. So wound packing would just involve soaking your gauze or soaking whichever wound, um, whichever substance you want to use to pack the wound. It's usually gauze in any of the um, topical therapies that we've described above. In our setting, most of the time we're using saline, but you can use any of the gels or um, things that I explained before. Um, then you can also decide on primary and secondary closure, depending on your wound, how your wound is healing. Negative pressure wound therapy is a topic on its own. I'm just going to speak briefly about it. This is also a modality that we can use for large tissue defects that require um, closure. They enhance wound healing by reducing edema surrounding the wound. They stimulate circulation and increase the rate of granulation tissue formation. The technique involves the application of a controlled subatmospheric pressure to the wound covered with a foam dressing. Um, and like I said, they usually used for large defects until you can perform your secondary closure. 
contraindications to negative pressure wound therapy would be an infected wound. You need to clear the infection before applying the back dressing. Devitalized tissue, um, inadequate debridement, exposed vital structures, malignant tissue, fragile skin, any adhesive allergies, and an ischemic wound. Coverage, I'm not going to go in detail about that, but those are basically just your skin grafts and your um, biological dressings, composed of live cell constructs that um, do you use to cover large defects that are created by your um, secondary intention wounds that heal and are not adequately epithelialized. Adjunctive therapies, um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is quite a new in thing. Uh, this is where you put the patients in a hypoxic, um, hypoxic chamber that um, applies a high dose of oxygen to the patient. But unfortunately, the problem with this is it's not focused to the wound. And the high oxygen levels have serious adverse events such as seizures and pneumothorax, which have been documented. Also, systematic reviews have not concluded whether they um, are beneficial in all wounds. They've been shown to benefit diabetic ulcers, which is not something we deal with all the time. But um, so there's not enough evidence yet to uh, support routine use. Other adjunctive therapies are your low frequency ultrasounds, electrical simulation, electromagnetic and phototherapy. Secondary wound care, this is the septic wound. So first thing that you need to do is be able to recognize that the wound is septic. So external evidence of sepsis, pus draining, erythema, induration. The first thing that's important for this is to open the wound. If you don't open the wound, the septic process is confined to the subcutaneous space, making the fascia vulnerable. And infection then causes diesence of the fascia and can extend to the intra-abdominal cavity. Surgical site infection can be classified as superficial incisional, deep incisional, or organ space, according to the location, timing of onset, and local signs and symptoms. Diagnosis is mostly dependent on the subjective assessment of pain or tenderness, swelling, erythema, and purulent discharge from the wound. Although there's no consensus on exact criteria um, as yet, signs of surgical site infection typically show up at least 48 hours after surgery, but can um, present up to 30 days post-surgery and up to a year following a prosthesis or total hip or knee replacement. The most common organisms are Staphylococcus aureus. That's uh, causing 15 to 20% of cases. Other organisms include gram-negative bacilli, coagulus-negative Staphylococci, Enterococcus, and E. coli. The RCOG NICE guidelines from 2017 to prevent sepsis showed that preoperatively, Cloexidine cleaning, prophylactic cephalosporin at least 60 minutes prior to surgery and to consider higher doses in the morbidly obese and do not shave the hair. Intra-op, maintain sterility, do not irrigate unnecessarily, do not use diathermy for the skin incision, maintain homeostasis, choose appropriate dressings, avoid staples or glues. The incision type was reviewed in a Cochrane review in 2013 which compared a Joel Cohen's incision with a Fan and Seal incision and overall, they showed a 65% reduction in post-operative febrile morbidity with the Joel Cohen. Blunt incision, I mean, dissection is always shows less uh, post-op infection compared to sharp dissection. Removal of the placenta, obviously, um, manual removal showed higher rates of infection. Exteriorization versus internal suturing of the uterus showed no difference in post-op sepsis. A meta-analysis by Calmet Al in 2004 showed closure of the subcutaneous fat um, in patients with a fat that, uh, thickness of greater than 2 centimeters showed a 34% decrease in wound disruption. Post-operatively, no touch application of the dressings, sterile water for cleaning up until 48 hours, and then after that, you shower or tap water to clean the dressing. If they are not infected, no antibiotics. The post-cesarean wound infection includes antibiotic treatment, wound exploration, and debridement as soon as indicated. Superficial wounds without a purulent discharge can be treated with antibiotics alone. When there is a purulent discharge or concern for deep surgical site infection, the wound must be explored. 
drained completely and irrigated two to three times a day to allow healing by secondary intention. Antibiotics should be continued until all signs of infection have resolved. There were no difference in surgical site infection when using different dressings, just to maintain the basic principles. And um, that dressings were not shown to be superior when used for acute surgical wounds. The most important, most dangerous of all the post-surgical site infections uh, is necrotizing fasciitis. It's associated with a 32.2% mortality rate. Common areas infected include your lower and upper extremities and the perineum and genital area. Antibiotics are not effective when used in isolation. There's poor delivery to the infected site due to ischemia and hypoxic tissue. They're only effective when used in conjunction with your surgical intervention. And the type of antibiotic depends on the type of necrotizing fasciitis that you have. Type 1 is your anaerobics, and you'll use metronidazole, clindamycin, or, car or carbapenem. Type 2 is your beta hemolytic strep, uh, first or second generation cephalosporin. Type 3 is your clostridium, gram negative, or vibrio. Um, that's usually in the perineum, and that would, you can use clindamycin, penicillin, tetracycline, or third generation cephalosporin. And type 4 are your candidates. Um, so you could use your fluconazoles and amphotericin B. So surgical debridement in these cases are life-saving and need to be done within 12 hours from the onset of symptoms. Mortality increases if delay in surgery is more than 24 hours. So your approaches is debridement, a necrosectomy or fasciotomy, depending on how far the, um, the infection has spread. The general rule is just debride until you find healthy tissue. Randomized trials have shown improved wound healing and reduction of wound surface when back dressing is used compared to conventional gauze therapy post debridement of necrotizing fasciitis. They also aid in granulation tissue formation. Future therapies with, for, for, for necrotizing fasciitis, your IV immunoglobulins, they are effective for streptococcal infections, decreased mortality risk in patients with streptococcal toxic shock syndrome, but there's still lots of studies that need to be done to determine the efficacy of this. And calistatin is effective in treating your group A strep infections and shown to increase survival rates as well as reduce local skin damage and bacterial count. This is just a, uh, another, doesn't show up very nicely on the projector, but um, from a Korean nursing university, uh, algorithm that goes from the top identifying your wound and the steps in how to identify what type of wood, what dressing you choose, nutritional factors, comorbidities, everything is, is addressed so that you don't miss anything. It's a nice um, graph to follow. And uh, another um, flow diagram from the Waterloo Wellington uh, Wound Care Foundation that um, how to deal with a pressure also. Um, so just in summary, for optimal wound healing, wound bed needs to be well vascularized, free of revitalized tissue, clear of infection, and moist. Wound dressing should be chosen based upon the ability to manage dead space, to control exudate, reduce pain during dressing changes, prevent bacterial overgrowth, and ensure proper fluid balance. They need to be cost efficient and manageable for the patient and nursing staff. Sharp surgical debridement is suggested over non-surgical methods for the initial debridement of devitalized tissue associated with acute and chronic wounds or ulcers when possible. Topical agents such as antiseptics and antimicrobial agents can be used to control locally heavy contamination. Significant improvements in rates of wound healing have not been found and tissue toxicity may be significant at disadvantage. For deep wounds, negative pressure wound therapy may protect the wound and reduce the complexity and depth of the defect. Negative pressure wound therapy is frequently used to manage complex wounds prior to definitive closure. Following wound bed preparation, acute wounds can often be closed primarily. Chronic wounds that demonstrate progressive healing as affected, evidenced by granulation tissue and epithelialization along the wound edge can undergo delayed closure or coverage with skin grafts or bioengineered tissues. Many other therapies have been used with the aim of enhancing wound healing and include hyperbaric oxygen therapy and wound stimulation using ultrasound, etc. Some of these therapies have shown marginal benefits in randomized studies and may be useful as an adjuncts for wound healing, but not on their own. Early recognition and surgical intervention is necessary for necrotizing fasciitis. So the dressings that we have available at Tigerberg at the moment 
are basically these um, granules. These ones I'm sure you've all seen for the pressure pressure sores. Um, the Aquacel AG is what they are using. This is the silver containing um, dressings. These are the ones that they use most commonly for the chronic wounds, so your non-healing surgical wounds or your pressure ulcers. Um, anything that has dead space, they they soak the gauze in these in this Aquacel AG and fill uh, the wounds. Um, this come feel cobalt. The QTMed is the new intracyte. Apparently, we do not have intracyte anymore at Tigerberg. This is our new intracyte. This is all just for exudate management. And we also have this honey product available. Thank you. Thank you, Karusha, for the talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, you said, or, or it says on the slide that the Royal College Guidelines says we should avoid using, I think it says um, something, I think, staples on the skin. Yeah. Glue and staples. Glue and I'm staples. not aware that staples, I think the last time we spoke about it, um, the, there is no, as far as I'm aware, no proof that staples causes more infection than, um, than suturing the skin. But we should look into that because as far as I have it, we routinely use staples still for the skin. If that's really a risk factor for infection, we should then look at that. Um, when I, lo I looked at the updated version, and they, they actually said that there was studies that showed that staples had a higher risk of, of wound infection, it's specifically. For, that, was, that, that was looking specifically at seizures. I think the one that I read myself, they just advise to avoid staples in people who are at risk of having sepsis, like diabetes patient, mm -hmm. then you should avoid that. But the question that I wanted to ask, actually it's almost the same, I just wanted to know if there's also evidence, because I see in when I started here, I was told to avoid using subcutaneous sutures for our seizure patient, and I asked as to why. And it was just said that no, because they are more at risk of having um, wound sepsis. So is there an evidence that the kind of sutures that you use, whether interrupted or subcutaneous suture with um, association with increased risk of developing wound sepsis? I didn't myself find any evidence on the type of suture and subcut sutures were not, there wasn't in, or from the, Papers that I read, there was no evidence to show that subcutaneous show had an increased risk of infection. The issue is, if the patient does become infected, the subcut sutures are difficult to remove, and then you get the problem of the sepsis draining down instead of out. So when you've got your interrupted sutures, the pus will have a way to come out instead of going through the fascia and interabdominally, and it's easier to remove one or two sutures with your interrupted sutures as to opposed to opening the entire wound when you've got your subcut sutures. Also, uh, sorry, the other thing is that our patients are larger and then subcut sutures, you don't really get that dead, you, you still leave a bit of dead space unless you're putting in your, your skin sutures as well as your subcut sutures. I think the Corona study also looked at this one of the things mm. that looked at and that didn't publish it because it was Um, like the only study that I found, like I said, vacuum dressings is a whole topic on its own, but um, they found that there was benefit in chronic wounds, but and like I said, large defects that can't be opposed, vacuum dressings were appropriate, but if you've got an acute surgical wound, primary closure was preferred. But like you said, now if you can't get primary closure, then that dressings were appropriately used for the healing of the, of the tissue. So I hope um, 
what uh, could with us will help us when we do have these type of patients, especially. I think we all see often obstetrics then dying. Um, but I'm sure if you just follow the basic principles of management of wound sepsis, then we might get on top of this uh, problem that we sometimes sit with in the wards. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thanks.